Hello and welcome to Taking Refuge, Finding Peace in the Time of the Virus. I'm Lizzie Lassiter, and joining us is Judith Hansen Lassiter. Hi, Mama. Hi. Hi so we're on, we're on live with 379 yogis around the world. Tell us where you are. Find the chat window, type in, let us know where in the world you are. I'm seeing Ohio, Cincinnati, Argentina, Toronto, Vermont, Netherlands, Brooklyn, Texas, New Jersey. Oh, God, it's going so fast we can't even read it. Finland, Montana, Charlotte, Ohio, Stockholm. Venice, Ojai, California, Missouri, Vero Beach, Pennsylvania, Alexandria, Virginia, Ann Arbor, San Rafael, California, Vancouver, New York City, Bogota, Louisville, Brazil. So this is our second this is our second empathy session. The first one is available on my YouTube channel. If you look Lizzie Lasseter YouTube, you can find it. And when you're watching on YouTube, you can go down to the little closed caption and you can turn on in any language that you want in case you're not a native English. Por ejemplo, español. So my darlings, First, what I wanted to do, Mom, before we get started in our, we have so many questions. We asked for questions beforehand and we got over 50 questions from students around the world. And also, I hope there'll be questions from people who are with us live. And we can turn on your microphone and hear your voice. That's what we'd really love if we call on you with one of your live questions. Um, but first, I just wanted to start with, sometimes in your classes, when people complain, you say, let's all just take a moment to complain. Conscious <laughs> complaining. Yeah, conscious complaining. It's all so, whine. No whining, just conscious. So I thought it might be interesting today for everyone to share one thing. It can be very petty and trivial that is driving them crazy with their current disrupted, locked down life. You can I'll type start. Yes, <laughs> mom's ready. I want to have a haircut. I'm dying to have a haircut. I can't get a haircut. I can't hug my mom. No plants from the, for the garden. My roots, Rebecca is saying. <laughs> Hair color. I hate not being able to hug people. I miss my students. Inertia. I'm eating too much ice cream. I need a pedicure. Bread. Bread. Everyone's eating bread. <laughs> my roommates are driving me crazy. <laughs> no human touch. I can't hug my grandchildren. No spending class. Yes. No floral shops. No pedicure. That's a good one. Yes. No swimming. Yes. I Somebody said they don't have anything to complain about. Too many dishes. <laughs> no five-day intensive with Judith. That was sweet. Oh, yeah. Mom had to cancel a bunch of things. All right. So before we jump into the, the first question, I really want to go to mom that someone submitted because it just tickled me. It's from Gail in New York. She says, Judith, do you ever find yourself overwhelmed? I've only see you, seen you calm, and I wondered if you get stuck in an anxiety spiral ever. Maybe you should answer that, Lizzie. <laughs> More objective. Gail, you are so sweet. Yes, I, I, I do feel upset. I want to tell you a quick story about that. I was teaching years and years ago, and a very young woman, about 16, who loved yoga, was in my class. And she came up to me and said, how, uh, with big eyes, you know, how many years have you been teaching? And I rattled off some number. And she said, oh, well, then you never must get angry or upset. And for a moment, just a tiny little moment, teeny tiny moment, I had this flash of, I wanted to say to her, yes, my child, I have transcended it. But I try to tell the truth. And I said, no, I still get angry and upset, but I'm just very aware while I'm doing it. <laughs> I thought that was funny. And she went, oh, she wrote it down. But I, I do want to say about overwhelm, that there's something that I've learned about when I hear myself saying I'm overwhelmed. Generally, it's not when there's one specific difficulty. Like often if it's one strong specific difficulty, 
you're focused on it. Mm -hmm. But the overwhelm, I think, at least for me, comes when I feel that I'm just being pulled in all these directions at once. My practice, my house, my cooking, my food, my uh, teaching, my whatever. I'm just, I have all these things I want to be doing everything at once and I'm not doing any of them. What I've learned to say to myself when that happens is, oh, what this means is I'm disconnected from God. I'm disconnected from the one. I'm disconnected from my own true self. Hmm. Because when I'm rooted in my own true self, that goes away because that is actually the highest form of refuge hmm. is to remember your true self. So there's a couple of people are saying in the chat that they're missing yellow Springs this year with you. Mm -hmm. Ironically, the topic for that workshop in yellow Springs, Ohio was letting go the heart of yoga. So I don't know how I was so prescient as to name it that because every year it's different, but letting go, even of the letting go workshop, there's so much letting go going on. Um, so maybe say a few things about refuge now. Yeah, we can talk about refuge. I want to just put you on the spot because it came up and ask you if you would share with us what was your thesis or your central teaching idea for the for that letting go workshop. I mean, it seems so relevant to us right now. Well, that's, I mean, how long have you got? I, I don't want to get too sidetracked on that, uh, but I did I did plan to talk about what physical letting go is emotional letting go, mental letting go, and spiritual letting go. And I'll tell you, physical letting go is what we learn in asana. Mm -hmm. That's the goal of it. It's not to get, it's not to get, you know, more agile, more flexible, more strong. Those are, those are, those will find you. But what we are to find is the consistent letting go, letting go of the, of the poses I love, letting go of the poses I don't, letting go of staying, letting go of, of being in the pose, let, letting go of difficulty and judgment and just this constant embodying. Asana is an embodied letting go. Mm -hmm. When you just lie down over a bolster with your knees bent and just let go, this is what asana is doing for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, the entire practice of the Yoga Sutra starts it, with ahimsa, which is letting go of your urge to violence. So right. the whole thing is about letting go. So right. that's like, that's like a little teaser for next year. <laughs> okay. So of the 50 questions that came in, mom made this really great observation that there were kind of four categories. Shall I read the categories, mom? No, no, let's do them as they come. Okay. So the first category was a lot of questions people were asking you about their own practice. Like, don't read the chat, mom. Don't read the chat. You're getting, okay. <laughs> you're getting distracted. Stay with me. Okay. <laughs> so questions about their own practice, like what feeling overwhelmed. And I'll pull, I pulled um, two examples that I thought were really um, pithy that explain, we got a ton of questions like this. So Mary Ann from Denver asked, uh, in these extraordinary difficult time, I'm focused, I'm having an extraordinarily difficult time focusing to maintain a yoga or breath practice, trying to cut off the news, but finding that difficult too. My head knows better, but day after day seems to repeat. Just writing this brings in self-criticism. Why can't I start with 10 minutes to begin? Um, thanks for holding these sessions. Stay safe and well. And then Mila. Let me just stay with that one first. Okay. And let me just ask in the chat, is anyone having similar feelings? Just type a yes. Or is, is Mary, is it Marianne? Is she, mm -hmm. is she here with us? Marianne, are you with us? Oh, no, now everyone's typing yes, 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 absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. So many people. Yeah. Uh, someone says no, my practice is better than ever. Uh-huh. We're coming to your house. <laughs> 
All right, so what would you say to the Mary Ann's? Because obviously many of us are in the same boat, finding it extraordinarily difficult to practice right now. Two things. Number one, I want you to say, you can all say this out loud where you are. How human of me. Of course, of course you're going to find it difficult. Life is difficult right now. You have so many more demands on you, most of us. The demand of loneliness, the demand of now children and now schooling them and now, you know, trying to entertain them. And there's just so many demands on you right now. So what I would say to her, to you, to all of us, is give yourself some empathy by saying how human of me to want to do everything well. Mm -hmm. That urge, may not be serving me as well as I want it to right now. Mm -hmm. That conscientiousness, that eternal list in the mind that keeps turning over may not be serving you right now. Mm -hmm. And so that's your letting go, Marianne, to notice, to notice that clinging to wanting it to be different is the suffering. Mm -hmm. And so what you might think of doing is two things. Number one, remembering this thought. Your yoga is too small in your mind. It's never the pose. It's never the breath. It's never the meditation. It's the residue they leave in us that's the yoga. So right now, you can take refuge in that thought. Mm. So your yoga is too small. Mm. What if you could take one slow, perfect breath, whatever that is, perfect in quotes, but one slow, long breath in which you are integrated body, mind, and soul, and one easy exhalation. Mm. That would change you instantly mm. so make take one breath mm. the other thing you can do is you can make it more fun you can you can do yoga with your kids if they're old enough or know enough i i used to do that sometimes when you were all were home from your various schools and one of you would want to do practice and i would just do whatever you wanted to do and the sequencing was horrible you know you're doing a forward bend and then a back bend <laughs> or a, a really easy pose, a hard pose, an easy pose. And I just did what I let go of that control urge and just did it for fun. So write some things that you like to do and some things you don't like to do, mix it up with breathing, whatever makes a list, put it in a hat, have one of your kids pull it out and do that. That's your practice. Mm. Because refuge, the practice is our refuge. We already know that. We have been training for so many years, some of us decades, for this moment of refuge. Mm -hmm. and we need to remember that refuge is not a location. It's an intention. Mm -hmm. You could be in the perfect mountaintop retreat right now. I'm sure someone is, you know, the perfect vegan, organic, raw, whatever food, the perfect view, the perfect yoga mat, the perfect teacher, the perfect, and you can still not feel connected. You can still not be in refuge because you brought yourself there. Mm -hmm. So refuge isn't where you are. It's, it's what your attention is. You know, the first three months after I had the twins, I did almost no formal asana practice. I was just too exhausted and too busy breastfeeding. <laughs> and if I had 20 minutes, I just wanted to sleep or shower. I was just telling someone this the other day. And sleep in the shower <laughs> or do, I mean, just basic human needs. But I, one idea I had during that time, which really served me well, I think, was I thought about my posture and I thought I'm ah. standing up, you know, and so can this be a yoga practice for me when I'm standing in the kitchen, whenever I'm standing, whenever I remember, can I find Tadasana? Can I have one breath here in Tadasana? And can I feel a little more? at home in my new non-pregnant body. And that was really powerful. So what do you think about yoga off the mat right now, mom? 
Well, I think that yoga on the mat and yoga off the mat is a false dichotomy. Mm -hmm. And that we're learning that right now. Mm -hmm. It's like Kali or the universe said, hmm, you like yoga? Watch this. <laughs> yeah. You like to practice yoga? Watch this. I'm turning up the heat. Yeah. Shall we take another question? So in that category, uh, let me, let me back up on myself a little bit. There, in the beginning, there's often a dichotomy between your practice and your life. And then I wrote that book, Living Your Yoga, because I began to discover the, you know, blinding flash of the obvious about living it. But now it's more than living it. It's ramped up to advanced practice, being it. Mm -hmm being it, not just doing it. Mm -hmm. That's it. All right. In that category of questions about practice, there were so many. Mila from Brazil has asked, how important is it to take refuge in ourselves in solitude and silence at this particular moment? Hi, Mila. There is nothing that is more important than that. Refuge is not, Mila, running away. It's moving toward what I'm choosing. Which is very difficult right now because so many of us have the instinct to run away from everything. Well, you know, there's, a, there's nothing like watching a silly movie with your kids on the couch and eating popcorn. But you can only do so much of that. The real, the real lesson is life has always been unpredictable, chaotic, and dangerous. It's yeah. always been that way, but we had so many ways of avoiding that understanding or minimizing it because we had seeming power and control. And those of us who, who are lucky enough to have no fear about our next meal and have some resources to actually be able to practice and teach yoga, which is such a blessing. We just, you know, we decide to do something and we do it. And it's not like that now. And we're really all having a, a postdoctoral uh, training in impermanence. Yeah. And, and the hardest thing for me right now, it's not really not getting a haircut. That was kind of, Light. It's, I can't plan anything. Oh, this is huge for mom. Mom is like a master planner. Mom will write me emails being like, um, in 2027, do you want to go to Beijing with me in September? <laughs> <laughs> like, uh... I mean, that's just the way I am. And so... Oh. I have, every, I have the book with everything in it, planning, everybody's birthdays, blah, 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 blah. I'm so planned. I've already got a birthday card in the envelope, addressed and ready to go, that I'm not even supposed to send until the 23rd of April. Mom. For someone after that. Um, so that's a hard one for me, and, and that's it's been a good one, too. I mean, I think you um, are not far behind me in the planning. No, I just am so grateful and blessed. I have this strange moment in my life where I had, because I have six month old twins, I had canceled everything for this year anyway. So I've been having this really strange sensation. My life has, almost, has changed so little because of the coronavirus. I'm having a sense like I'm out of touch with the world because I was already in this very isolated, nested you know, our days are just getting up at seven when the babies wake up, diaper change, diaper change, nap, bottle, boob, diaper change, diaper change, walk, <laughs> bottle. It's just like, and that's just, there's a kind of metronome to baby life that is just going. And so that's been my, my very strange moment right now. I haven't canceled anything because I didn't, I, my calendar was empty. To begin with. That's a wonderful thing. I, I find, uh, and I'll have to move on to maybe the next category, but um, I find that having a routine for me, get up, have tea with, you know, Joe and, and then, you know, do, do for a walk and then my practice or do my new 
stationary bike that we have now. Uh, I love doing that, sweating a bit. Um, but, you know, and then a rhythm and then eating and then working and um, that helps me too. All right, let's move on. Okay. To we tell need us to what the next one is. I'm going to tell us the next category. And I just lowered all the hands, people who had raised their hand. I want to ask you to raise your hand again if you want to ask a question live now, because I will be able to turn on your audio and we'll hear your questions. So if you have any questions, we'll do one now from the list and then we'll take a live question. So um, the next category that we pulled out was how and what to teach online. Everyone, you know, yoga has shifted online. So many of us are teaching now online. So here's a question from Francis in the UK. Judith, since the UK went into lockdown, I have been offering a daily practice, slow hatha meditation and relaxation sessions via Zoom. And I'm really enjoying the connection with old students and new. However, my passion is restorative yoga and I haven't yet found the courage to share what I love so deeply. There's a block. I feel nervous that I may not do it justice as can't be in the room to support an individual. As I write this now, I'm thinking, is this my ego? Should I just get out of my own way? Your advice and feelings about this would be appreciated. I'm just one small step away from sharing my passion. Francis, I, I would love it if Francis happened to be online, but I'm guessing she may not. Francis, raise your hand if you're online. Yes, she's on. Can oh, I turn? Excellent. I'm going to allow you to talk, Francis. You have to unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, Francis. Hi. So, where, what, where are you in the UK? I'm in Bedfordshire, which is a village about 40 miles north of London. Bedfordshire? Yes. Okay, well, we're so happy to have you. And thank you for your thoughtful question. And know that I am sending you a great deal of support uh, just through reading your question. I feel connected with you. I firmly believe that no one is qualified to teach yoga. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> including me, including Lizzie, including B. Kess Iyengar, including everyone, because it is such a vast and massive topic. So if we're not going to teach because we don't know enough, we're never going to teach because we never know enough. And you know, Francis, that when you ever you teach, you always learn something, you always gain something from it. And that's part of why we're so addicted to it, because of what it does for us, how we shift, how our heart opens, no matter what's going on. When I would leave the house to go teach my regular classes when the kids were young, when I walked in that door, I was present with my students and I walked out the door, I always felt better. Yes. Always emotionally, physically, I might be a little tired, but I felt better. So let me please disabuse you of the idea that you don't know enough. No one knows enough. <laughs> and the idea that you teach, that you teach your passion is, is cap encapsulated in a, in a phrase that I like very much, which is trust yourself first. So I want everybody to say that out loud right now. Say it, Francis. Let's all say it. Trust, Trust yourself, yourself first. first. Say it again. Trust, Trust yourself, yourself first. first. Excellent. So it, it, notice that I didn't say trust yourself only. But when you stand on the mat, metaphorically, virtually, literally, whatever, open your heart, ground, in, ground into the moment. Trust, your, trust yourself first and teach from your heart. Fantastic. I mean, that's, that's because that's why they come to your class. Yeah. For that connection that people get healed by having an authentic connection with an authentic human being. And it is our job, Francis, I believe, to do the work we need to do on our own mat, in our own lives, with our own study, and our own self-awareness, and our own letting go that so we can stand on the map and be authentic and that models for them how to be authentic in their life so if you just if you really believe one day you should just give them a restorative pose or they, they need to move first just make it simple just say lie down i did a live talk yesterday 
through Health Flix, H E A L T H Flix, F L I X, dot online. And it's out of the UK, I believe. And I taught a Shavasana. I, I told them what to have in advance. I say, lie down, just put your feet up on an ottoman, on a chair, low chair, on a couch, get a throw pillow from the couch, bring it down all the way to the bottom of your neck to where it starts to be your back. Mm -hmm. Cover your eyes with a cloth, cover up. Yeah, uh, just, and teach them because desperately they need your authenticity and the, and your, and the fact that you slow them down and internalize them. So how mm -hmm. do you feel now hearing that? Um, I feel quite emotional and I'm touching my heart. Um, and I know that I teach from my heart and I share from my heart and you've given me permission. <laughs> Um, one thing I do feel when I'm teaching, I feel that I am surrounded by you, Lizzie, everybody that I've been in the room with and had the privilege of, of sharing. I feel everybody around me. Francis, thank you for that. I, I just want to say one thing. I have not given you permission. You have given me <laughs> absolutely. I'm not in charge of you, Francis. I'm barely in charge of me. <laughs> I just certainly was never in charge of Lizzie. <laughs> I was in charge of the family from the time she was three. We all did what she said, um, pretty much. But you know what to do. Yes, I do. Thank I you. Say thank you so much. That was an absolute blessing. I looked forward to seeing you in October. Good. You're a blessing. Thank you. Keep it up. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Francis. Um, Catherine just typed into the chat. I wanted to call this out. She writes, my wonderful teacher has been delivering restorative yoga online. It's not the same as being in class because she tucks us in and helps us to adjust ourselves to the most amazing, comfortable asanas. But just being there and connecting with us makes it completely amazing. So it is really, it is harder to teach restorative online than in person, of course, but I think people need restorative now more than ever. More than ever. Because they're freaking out. We're all freaking out. <laughs> all right, we need to laugh more. All yeah. right, should we go to the next category? Mm -hmm. So you can continue to raise your hand if you want to ask a question live like Francis did. Um, okay, so... I still see Francis. How do you offer support? Here's a question from Tawny, also in England. She writes, how do you offer support and guidance in class when you're also dealing with the same fears and anxieties as your students? I assume she means about the coronavirus. Cool. I'm trying to stay grounded, but I sometimes get waves of sadness and feel like I don't have anything worth to offer when I'm also trying to deal with uncertainty of my current situation. Is she with us? Are you with us, Tawny? Raise your hand. I can search GAW. No, she's not with us. All right. Now I'm still seeing Francis. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I like seeing her. Um, and this person's name is what? Tawny. T A W N Y. Tawny. There's a a wonderful saying that I like. And it's when in doubt, tell the truth. And since I'm almost always in doubt, so I don't think there's any harm. In fact, I think it might give people empathy if you, Tawny, say in just a simple way, you know, I'm feeling anxious today. Some days during this whole process, I feel more optimistic. Today, I'm feeling a little a little down and a little anxious. So I really need, uh, I, I can understand if you're feeling the same way. So let's get on our mats together and do some breathing and some stretching and support each other now. And you don't want to go into your personal details or use it as a time for your own, you know, someone to comfort you. But just to admit clearly and simply, you know, one day 
I walked into the class is my more experienced students. And I was so, I just had a, a fight with your father and there was, I don't know, it was like three things. And I just went, okay, I'm here to teach you how to be calm and grounded, but I just had a fight with my husband. My children drive me crazy and the washer is broken. And everyone just started laughing. It just, in, I mean, that was the only time I ever did that particular thing, but it just felt in the moment, trusting myself mm -hmm. first, like just to admit that and everybody laughed. And then we went on with the class. That's the, when we as teachers show our true authentic selves, not to get empathy from others or to manipulate them or for any other reason, but because that is the truth of this moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, Joe and I are together so much that our conversations, like we have to work now to make them more interesting. It's not like, <laughs> I'm gone off doing something and doing and bring back, you know, he's gone off doing working, whatever. It's like the big question is like, what are we going to have for dinner? <laughs> and I used to bring it up at dinner for the next night. Cause I'm a planner. He says, no, we can't talk about dinner for tomorrow. Well, we're dinner. <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah. So I, I think that, uh, Tony, that of course you're sad. I mean, you're human. You feel, you feel the zeitgeist. You feel the soup we're all in. And sometimes maybe just to say, or maybe you don't want, you want, you know, you could say the opposite. Like if this spell arose in you, like, okay, today I just want to forget about everything. And I just want to have fun with you doing yoga. Mm -hmm. And then, so what do you think the balance is mom? Because it somehow seems strange if you're teaching a live class right now to ignore hundred percent the situation, but it also we're so inundated with it. It seems like a lot of our conversations with friends are about it. Like we maybe want yoga to be a refuge where we don't say the C word. <laughs> yeah. So that goes down to those three words, trust yourself first. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you can tell them a bad yoga joke. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. I'm not, I don't want to tell you strategies. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you refuge is going toward what you want. So make a ritual, have them stand off the mat. Now step, step on the mat. Now we're, we're shedding mm -hmm. everything. When I remember I had this teacher uh, who had us take off all our jewelry mm -hmm. as a way of shedding. I like that. I think we are, you know, so the, the whole idea is to do your own practice and be true to yourself and let that be what comes out of you. Mm -hmm. Just like if you're very excited about a certain pose right now and you're doing a lot, then you find yourself teaching it a lot because it's what, what's alive in you. Mm -hmm. And that's what keeps the teaching and the practicing alive. Shall we, shall we go to the next or where are we? Do the we next category, one? category number three of the four of what people um, wrote in. A lot of people wrote about in large terms, finances, financial questions, uncertainty. Uh, there was one great question that I will read about a woman with her studio. Nancy from Bozeman, Montana writes, dearest Judith, I feel caught between surviving and thriving. Is this a time to surrender and simplify or stand strong and be resilient? Finances are threatening to close down my studio, which I just opened in January of 2019 as a home for my teacher trainings and community classes for baby boomers and beyond. However, not wanting to go into more debt, I'm considering letting it go to shift to more online programming and teaching out of my home. This idea feels creative and light, yet makes me sad because the studio is a perfect fit in so many ways and more professional. Will I regret losing it or am I overly attached? I am feeling paralyzed in my decision since we are still in the throes of isolation. I question the bigger message here. Simplify or preserve, what would you do? Are you with us on, on, in the call, Nancy? You can, let me start. Oh, Nancy, how are you, sweetheart? Yes, Nancy Ruby. All right, I'm gonna tr allow you to talk. If you'd like to talk, you just unmute yourself. Thank you. I love Hi. the question. Nancy, it's been a long time since I've seen you. I know, I miss you. I miss you too, and I love your butterfly. <laughs> so Nancy, Lizzie, would you read 
uh, the la Nancy may not remember exactly what she wrote. Would you just read the last sentence? I, the, I question the bigger message here. Simplify or preserve, what would you do? All right, Nancy. Whenever I find myself in the position of thinking there are only two solutions, yes or no, off or on, uh -huh. let go to the studio or keep it, I know, I know now and I remember that I am not living in reality. Because whatever problem there is, there is a multitude, a multitude of, of responses to that. So the first thing I'd like you to do is to say how human of me. Can you say that for us? <laughs> how human of me? To believe that there's two choices and how, and I want to uh, support you and acknowledge how much you care and how much you've thought about this issue because a lot of us are in this issue i mean yeah. lizzie and i are lucky because we started online courses four years ago so we've become familiar with how to use the lighting and the you know the technical part but also how to do it but uh, if i believe that i could never actually be present and look my student in the eye or actually add a light and welcomed and uh, allowed per, you know, by them, their permission, touch to help them or to adjust a prop so that the student goes, ah, oh, it's so much better or be in that space of the Sangha, I would be very sad. So it is uh, right now, we have decisions to make. You have a decision coming down the line that you have to quote unquote will have to make but you, have, you don't have enough information to make that, you don't know, is this gonna last two months, five months, a year? If we don't know that's part of the anxiety is you need to make a decision you feel and you have inadequate information. And that's my definition of hell. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah, so, or the, the, the second definition of hell that I like is, is having responsibility for something, but not the power to make it happen or not happen or whatever. You're, you've got the responsibility, but for some reason, the situation is you don't have the power to use it. Um, that's a second level of hell. So may, may I uh, suggest some ideas? Please. Have you, and you don't need to answer any of these because we don't need, you don't need to reveal personally what you're thinking or doing, just, just ideas. What about the possibility of negotiating with your landlord? Because if we can think about the landlord, we, we have empathy for you about your situation because many of us are literally in that situation. But what about the landlord? I mean, he's Absolutely. not, he, what is happening with, you don't, you know, you don't know, you don't know who's gonna wanna rent someplace now. I mean, I don't think the rental business is very good right now. The home buying business, I mean, there's so many businesses that are in limbo. And uh, so maybe he would be willing to negotiate that you, you know, you renegotiate your lease so that you change, you, you uh, don't pay for six months and then pay him back slowly after that, or you reduce the rent or uh, some way of meeting his need. Now, this is the key to know that you're in it together, you know, that you understand that he's also in a difficulty. If you stop, then it, he would probably be empty for months. Uh, Cause who's wanting to start a business right now? So, so something that would meet his needs for cash flow and also yours, there are all kinds of ways you could work it out with him. Maybe you want to start doing your online stuff at your studio teaching your online classes and paying him 15% of what you make from the class or instead of rent. I mean, there's a million ways to look at it. So how do you feel hearing those strategies? That, that's excellent. I actually just talked to him and he's extremely negotiable, which is lovely. And I'm, I'm just not willing to go back into debt. So, but he's willing to forgive rent until it works, which is great. I just don't know. I think the hard part is the not knowing our students going to come back in and they are showing up to my online classes, but the teachers have kind of scattered because everyone's freaking out right now. So the teachers have all scattered and mm -hmm. 
you know, who's coming back. So yes, I, it's true. I need to gather more information. And that's, that's what my logical mind knows. <laughs> yes. So but not, it's not, it's not available. The real information is when is this going to be over is not available to any of us. Right. Here's the thing, Nancy, the irony of your statement. You don't know if the students are coming back. You don't know that every week <laughs> because you're only as good as your last class. <laughs> You know, I mean, there's that, all that is like a, See, that is like a yoga teacher disease or sickness or like core anxieties. When you walk into the room every week, is like, is there going to be someone here? <laughs> like, is, did someone come to my class? Is is someone going to sign up? Are they going to show up at this workshop? Yeah. So that really isn't any different. True. <laughs> I mean, that's why we need to be authentic and develop a relationship with human beings and teach from our heart and love what we do because that is success. Yeah. I think that students will come back. Someone else is also saying that in the chat. Um, Lori is saying that I really think students are going to come back because they're deeply craving. We're now understanding the value of human connection and our social structures. And mm -hmm. I think we're gonna, when, when this begins to fade, we're gonna see it as even more valuable to have human to human contact. Absolutely. So maybe everyone will get off Twitter. That's my dream. <laughs> I, was on, I was on Twitter for a while and I followed my children and the Dalai Lama. <laughs> and then it got, Twitter became a place I didn't enjoy being and I just got off Twitter and you know what happened? Nothing, nothing. But you know, I also think yoga teachers are in a unique position. I read a book years ago, five years ago or something about the new economy and what's gonna happen with outsourcing and, and uh, artificial intelligence and when all the, when so many right. jobs go away. But jobs like yoga teaching, yes, we can do some of it online, but the core of our work is, is it's a, it's that's a, what we it's need a it. Person to per, it's a, well, think of it. Yoga was traditionally taught one-on-one. -on -one. It is, yeah. it is always fundamentally big, a very personal, intimate one-to-one. -one. I mean, I don't want a massage from a robot. <laughs> Although I've had a couple, I have to say, unfortunately, but I want, massage from a person yeah i don't want a machine to make my food yeah so people you're exactly right i and i think you're brilliant because you agree with me or i agree with you you're brilliant whatever so i think we are in a unique position there will be more yoga online but that was happening anyway yeah yes right. and i'm hoping nancy i hope everybody's well and happy at your house Thank you, Nancy. I hope as well that for some, uh, some studio owners and teachers in this time that this will be the nudge that, they, that we all needed to get our online act together. And that hopefully it, once we get back into the real world, the online will be a second source of revenue for people. You mean or, the, the, the previous world? It's always been what it is real. Yeah, the, the in-person, person-to-person yeah, world. Person. People want that. I mean, I had to postpone a, a London workshop, two London workshops um, from March and early April to, I'm supposed to be in Portugal right now, sitting by a swimming pool, um, but uh, to October and people were so happy and they, you know, they just rolled over and the workshops are filled again, I think. And you know, whatever. So I definitely think people are going to come back and they're exactly right. And I think we should recognize the importance of what we do and what we offer people is this refuge. Yeah. If they get nowhere else, doesn't mean we're important. We shouldn't confuse those. But the message that we carry and the skills that we have and have the privilege, not the right, but the deep, unending privilege to share this work is, is what the world needs. You've heard me say this before. It doesn't need a perfect dog pose. It certainly doesn't need a lot of chaturangas, but maybe some people like them. But 
it needs that personal integrated human contact. Of course, they'll come back. Mm. It will look different afterwards. Mm. But maybe not all of that difference will be what we would put in the category of bad. Yeah. All right. So so the last one. We're going. There's so there's so much. Um, I just wanted to call out. Laura said that she's signing off to go teach a restorative yoga live stream class, and I just think that's so beautiful. Perfect. That, perfect. Um, okay. So category number four. The first category was questions about our own practice. Number two was how and what to teach online. Number three, finances. And number four, there was a lot of questions about our changed home lives now. Um, dealing with spouses, partners who are around too much, kids, additional demands. So the question we pulled out for that was from Holly. Um, Where is she from? It says RYT. Holly uh, from Vernon Hills, Illinois. I'm a yoga instructor and mother of three, ages four, six, and eight. And my daily practice is a sanctuary of sanity. But somehow the very first yama of ahimsa still evades me. How can I be more compassionate? How can I be a more compassionate parent at home with them, homeschooling, et cetera? And how can I be more patient with my expectations? Will you see if she's with us? Yes, let's ask. Holly, are you with us live? Let me type in her name. With two? Holly, yes, I'm going to allow you to talk, Holly. If your kids aren't screaming in the background, you can unmute yourself. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How are you? We're good. Good. (laughs) It's nice to meet you, Holly. Welcome. Thank Um, you. Do you want to change your question or modify it or any way, or are you content with it? Um, it's, it's an evolving process. And, um, I feel like, uh, the asana practice is something that I'm able to master, but I feel like the yamas and the niyamas are way harder (laughs) And it's, I just feel like I, I'm a witness of my emotion rising, like if they're not meeting my expectations with uh, different demands, but um, how can I be patient? I can stop myself, but it's, I feel still a little powerless. Well, the key to not feeling powerless is to focus as you seem to be doing on self-reflection. And you are feeling the most human of difficulties. Being a mother was the hardest asana ever and the best. And so there are so many have to's and shouldn'ts we put on ourselves as mothers. And I remember that I put, maybe this will resonate with you and give you some empathy. I wanted to be the perfect mother Hmm. until I realized that was impossible and that being a good mother was enough. But a good mother didn't mean that my needs were not important that I hope that you have the support where you can actually leave and go for a walk by yourself with no little person, you know, pulling on you, wanting to, you know, wanting physical contact, wanting to talk, wanting your attention, throwing up on you, (laughs) whatever, spitting up on you, Lizzie. Like having some moment where you literally are alone. When my kids got to be, I had three also, you know, a little bit older to where the oldest one was maybe 10 or 11. Or Sometimes I would just say to them, okay, I'm going in my room now for 15 minutes and closing the door. Do not knock on the door unless someone is bleeding a lot. <laughs> 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 what I was doing was showing them that self-care is critically important. And I would do things like, when I had an older one like that, his first child was a very responsible type. I would say, okay, I, I want you to babysit your brother and your sister, even in the house, down on the bottom floor in the toy room or whatever, and I'd be upstairs. 
And I'd say, okay. And I would pay the older one a dollar an hour to be the babysitter. And I would pay the other two 50 cents an hour to mine. <laughs> so everybody had a job. And yours are a little young for that, but keep that in mind because, and if you, if you were paying, being paid 50 cents an hour to mine and you didn't mind your older brother, you were in trouble. But if he told you to do something that was, that was, you, you know, you shouldn't have done or shouldn't be doing, then he was in trouble, but everybody had a job. And so what I'm saying is, you will come up with strategies. You're brilliant. You've been, you've been wrangling three kids for years is create a space for you. And, and I'm guessing that you like planning. Yeah. So for me, it wasn't just catch as catch can that space. It was knowing at four o'clock for 45 minutes, I belong to me. Yeah. And I could count on that all day. I know when I was with Lizzie during the month of November helping with the twins, they were between five and eight weeks old and we were having help come at seven and I'd look at her sometimes and I'd say an hour and five minutes till she gets here. <laughs> and then it was like 35 minutes, 30, because even with two of us and, and, and her husband, it was like three of us and two kids. It was still so a lot. Uh, so, and use that time to feed yourself. Maybe you just go lie on your mat and cry. <laughs> maybe you go for a walk maybe you know you you will understand the strategy but it is not just useful it is imperative that you do this for your mental and emotional health is the best gift you can give your children is a mother whose eyes light up when they walk in the room hmm. and that you know, happen if you don't take care of you so how do you feel hearing that it's very helpful um can you hear me still sure yes. oh yes and uh i think um was that writer tanya um i said that as well that you should light up in the you have that light in your eyes when you see your kids and i do when i see them in the morning but, but, not by the, your time. <laughs> but by the end of the night, I'm like so frazzled and I'm pleading with them to go to bed. And my favorite part of being a parent is reading to them and going into the world of an author. Sure. But that's why I don't have the energy for it. Well, you know what? Try this. I used to do this. I don't know. You were, you, I don't even know if you were born yet when I started doing this, Lizzie, and you may not even remember it, but I used to take them. I don't think I did it much with Lizzie, but with the first two. I would get a book and we would go in the hallway and we would all lie down and put our legs up the wall. And I would read, you know, whatever it was. And I got to where, this is terrible. I, I just want you to hear this and no one else. Is that I, I could, some of these books I read so many times that I could just read the book and, and think about something else. But anyway, I would, we would just lie there with our legs up the wall. I love that. And, and read a story while we did it. And I did it, you know, and then I also did the thing of we're all going to lie here for five minutes and don't move. And if you do that, then you get your own eye bag, mm. own colored <laughs> eye bag that you get to have and you get to pick it out. I mean, I was, I, I was always trying to incorporate <laughs> resting and because the end of the day is, you know, everyone's tired. It's really, resting. I said, I said to Nico the other day, my favorite time of the day, my favorite thing with the babies is when they're asleep at night. And he was like, that's like not having babies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got that, did you? <laughs> oh, did I say something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> no. no, I remember the baby stage. Oh, boy. <laughs> All right, Holly, thank you so much. Thank you. This was extremely help. helpful. Good. Okay, so it is, we have four more minutes okay. and mom, get organized. Mom has a poem for us. She has a closing quote. And I forgot to make my announcement at the beginning. We scheduled this webinar today because we have just opened a new course that mom and I have been working on for the last month. And it is live starting today at lassiter.yoga. Here's the website. And it's called Pranayama Intensive. So we felt like this is the perfect 
chunk of material to dive into. It's all about building a home practice. And there's a special sale for the coronavirus. It's called the coronavirus sale because we know people are um, more uncertain about money right now. So there's a, that goes until April 20th. So if you click through to lasseter.yoga, you can find, read more about the course. What do you, do you want to say something about why pranayama, why now? I just want to say the whole title. It's pranayama intensive. Create a home practice one breath at a time. It's all about home practice. And in this course, five, five weeks, there are mm -hmm. three live sessions. So we get to be together again. Yeah, we're going to do three live sessions. So we go through it. We'll go through it together, all, all of us, these five weeks, the next five weeks I'm starting. Say something that I wanted to say the whole time and I haven't said. Say it which is finding refuge in our meditation. To me, it's about creating the willingness to sit there and create, allow, evoke the willingness to love my judging, relentless mind. Not to go anywhere else, but mm -hmm. to go more deeply. And I have a quote for you today before I read the poem. Tell us your quote. It's from Nelson Mandela. It always seems impossible until it's done. Mm. So the poem uh, I'd like to read came to me one day on my yoga mat, very just sort of fell in my mental lap. And it's called Sweet Body. Mm -hmm. So may I read? Please. Sweet, soft body that carries my radiant soul, I do not thank you enough. I do not enjoy you enough. I do not cherish you enough. More and more now, I feel an upwelling of gratitude for all you have given me. For the ability to dance, to laugh, to weep, and to inwardly soar with the beauty of this world. For three babies, there's one of them, on the screen for the three babies plump and juicy and full of spontaneous joy and curiosity for this miraculous life for a heart that has been broken and mended more than once for the delicious taste of love for the many chances i have had to make mistakes and then try to learn from them dear body you are the true companion of my life the vessel of my wonder, the holder of my felt intris intrinsic wisdom, the container of my sacred self. Forgive me. Mm. Thank and you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Lizzie. May we live like the lotus at home in the muddy water. Namaste. Namaste. Goodbye, everyone. I see you, Heidi Goldman. Thank you for joining us. Bye. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Love to you all. Bye. Bye.